There are two schools of thought in test-driven development, the London School and the Classicists or Chicago School. But what's the difference? Do you need to pick one over the other? And what's all this fuss about mocking anyway? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the episode today, please hit like as well. I'd like to begin as usual by thanking our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, and Transfic. They're all great supporters of this channel, so please do support them in return by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about test-driven development, check out my highly reviewed training courses that can help you to learn this valuable technique that will in turn help you to become a better developer. There is a free basic tutorial and my flagship course, Test Driven Development Design Through Testing. Check out the links to both in the description to this video. The two schools of thought in test driven development are certainly there, but if I'm honest, I've never seen any radical conflict between them. The Classicist School, also known as the Detroit or Chicago School of Test Driven Development, is the version described by Kent Beck and his colleagues. This is characterised by being focused on changes in state or return values from functions. We test a method and verify that we get the return value that we expected, or that the state of the object changed in the way that we expected. The London School is really characterised by two things. Driving design from the top down, we start with high level acceptance tests, that usually in a BDD style, and then drive the design from there. Now we focus more on the interactions between the pieces of our system rather than the state. I think that this is a fair summary of how most people characterise these two different approaches. But in reality, I think that both of these explanations are a little bit oversimplistic. I think that these are more like caricatures of what both groups really meant. Let's start by dispelling the idea of warring factions, and then look at what I, and I think most test driven development experts, would advise. As well as defining the Chicago School of TDD, Kent Beck also wrote the foreword to the book that most clearly defined the London School, Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests. In his foreword to that book, he said this, The style of test room development presented here is different from what I practice. I can't yet articulate the difference, but I have learned from the clear, confident presentation of the author's techniques. The diversity of dialects has given me a new source of ideas to further refine my own development. So there's no big fight going on here. Sorry if that disappoints you. I guess we should get my own stance on all of this out of the way too. I was a fairly early adopter of test driven development in the late 1990s and we based our approach on Kent Beck's Extreme Programming book. But we interpreted it to mean that we always start from tests. So my team developed a kind of top down approach that was in some ways similar to the London School. It worked very well. Later I worked at ThoughtWorks in London which was also the home to several leading members of something called the Extreme Tuesday Club. This group included uh, Nat and Steve, who wrote the Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Test book, which defined the London School. So I was also an early adopter of some of their ideas too. My approach then is not purely in either camp, or how I think of it, it's really an amalgamation of both. Let's get to some code and look at an example of the differences between these two different schools of thought. Here's my take on a Chicago style test. Let's imagine that we're going to build a bookstore of some kind. Here's my first test. It it creates a bookshop, adds a book to it, and then confirms that we can retrieve the same book. Fair enough, it's not a very good bookshop, but you have to start somewhere. This is a pure Chicago school. Uh, test. We establish the state of the system, then check that it's in the state that we think it is by interacting with it. This is very obviously a very useful thing to do for some parts of the problem. And let's be clear, you always need to do this at some point in your testing. The next step is a bit more interesting. As our bookshop design evolves, we decide that we need the concept of a warehouse, 
Its job will be to keep track of the books that we have available to sell. This changes our design and our first test. If we're practicing test room development, then we write the test first. We've just added a new idea, the idea of a warehouse. For our test to work, we are going to need to put a book into the warehouse so that we can get it back from the bookshop. We could create the warehouse inside the bookshop and leave the ability to add books to, in, to the shop in place in the interface to the bookshop. Then delegate the implementation of actually storing the books to the warehouse. But this is a pretty nasty design. It's going to leave us with a bookshop with an ever-expanding interface as we add new features. Adding books is really a backroom function of a bookshop. Let's make adding books the job of the warehouse and remove it from the shop. This improves the separation of concerns considerably. So my bet is that when Kent and his crew wrote code like this, they probably still use dependency injection as I have here. In case you didn't notice, that's a small step in the direction of the London School. Because if we have access to dependencies in the test to set their state, we also have access to those dependencies that allow us to see what happened to them, which is really about looking at the interactions as the London School proposes. So this kind of design promotes the use of dependency injection, which is a good thing in terms of increasing the quality of our design. So now we create a warehouse, add a book to it, and add the warehouse to the bookshop. So we've simplified the interface to the bookshop and better focused it on the shopping part of the problem. In this example, my concrete warehouse is a real thing. It really stores books and really returns them when asked for. My implementations here are honestly trivial, so this makes perfect sense for now. But it can lead to some problems later. This is another way that people sometimes talk about the differences between the London and Chicago schools. They usually characterise this as what's a unit. In the Chicago school, the examples we've seen so far, the unit is, a kind, of, is kind of pragmatic, a small collection of pieces that together deliver some behaviour. They can answer the question that our test poses. In this case, a bookshop, a book and a concrete warehouse. All of these are real production code, but they're close collaborators that allow us to do useful things, and so we test them together and probably also separately in more detail too. In the London School, the overly simplistic take is that a unit is always a class. This is not quite true, but it's nearly true. It's not true because if you were to take this at face value, it would mean that when testing a bookshop, we shouldn't use a real book, we should fake it. But the London School isn't quite that dumb and avoids this by treating values and objects differently. So it's fine to use a real value type in your test, but you don't use real objects, things that can change state. I make this seemingly pedantic point here because I have seen some pretty terrible things done with mocks in the past. This guideline is meant to avoid some of the worst forms of mocking catastrophe, I suppose. Which gets us to perhaps the biggest defining characteristic of the London School, mocks. Mocks are fake versions of bits of code that we need for a test. But we use mocks when we aren't really interested in the real version. Remember, the focus on interactions that I mentioned earlier. The mocks are there to help us measure those interactions. Where we have an interaction with something outside the thing that we want to test, we create a fake implementation of the interface to that thing that represents the interaction. And we supply that instead of the real thing. This has several nice properties. It means that during development, we can start representing such interactions before we've got a real version, and even before we have a very clear idea of what we need from it. This is one aspect of the growing part in growing object-oriented software guided by tests. Used sensitively, this is a big win in our ability to make good, effective progress in the midst of uncertainty, which is where we always are when we're designing. We can quickly and easily at test time play with the ideas and evolve the interactions that we need. None of this says we need to use mocks, only test doubles, which is actually the broader concept. Test doubles come in several different types. 
Mucks are just one of those types. I tend to use mucks and fakes most often in low-level test-driven development, and stubs and spies in the higher-level acceptance testing. Mucks are automatically generated implementations of, depend of the dependencies that we need for our testing. They usually work by us providing a template for what it is that we need to t in the test, and our mucking library giving back a muck version of that thing. We can further program the mock to respond in ways that will help us in our test. And once in use, the mock records all interactions with it, so that later we can ask what really happened in our test. That's it. That's all that mocks really do. We pass the mock version into the code that we're interested in testing, and now we have a measurement point where we can simulate state and record interactions. People get into all sorts of horrible messes with mocks. The trouble is, is that they're quite powerful. So it re it's really easy to program all sorts of complicated behavior through the mocking system. If you ever find yourself in this situation, stop. Calm yourself a bit and look at your design. If your mocking is complex, it's telling you that your design sucks. We'll come back to that later. Let's look at uh, our London School example of our uh, code. Here we are taking the same step as before, introducing the idea of a warehouse. We don't know what we want of our warehouse yet, but this test is starting to tell us. So we've created a warehouse interface and a mock of that interface. We've decided that when we ask the bookshop for a book, we will delegate that request to the warehouse. So we add find book to the warehouse interface. In our test, we program our mock to return the book that we're looking for. The warehouse is where the books are stored, so we can once again remove the add book function from our shop. Finally, we can test that we got the right book back as before. Remember, the focus of our test here is the bookshop, not the whole system. In fact, we don't have a whole system until we've got a concrete implementation, a real version of the warehouse. This is a good thing because we can make progress in well-controlled baby steps. This is an example, and as it stands, I can almost hear you shouting at the screen about the waste of code in having the meaningless facade of the bookshop when the warehouse is doing all the real work. But it is only an example. In a real system, I'd probably still start here, but with the full expectation that bookshop will grow and add all sorts of things that warehouse will never be involved in. Design is largely about deciding where you want to put behavior. Here, I've decided that bookshopness belongs in the bookshop and warehouseness belongs in the warehouse. We could imagine bookshop later on uh, going and collecting all the cover art and adding it to the book before it returns it, or changing the price because of a special promotion that's going on. This separation of concerns in my design gives me a place to put all of that stuff and to test it in isolation of other things. I may decide that those things don't belong in the bookshop either uh, and are based on other dependencies, but one thing I'm pretty sure of is that these things don't belong in a warehouse. The London School is really an extra layer of ideas on top of the Chicago School that allows us to proceed when we have fewer answers. So now, let's look at some of the downsides of each of these approaches. I think the London School adds the ability to make progress more quickly when we don't understand the interactions that we want, as I've described. But there's another big benefit. If we take the simplistic view of Chicago, there are two strategies. We either do bottom-up design, which means that we need to have some version of the overall design in our head in order to identify the pieces that we want to test, develop with test driven development. Or we take a top down approach, and that means that we run the risk of our test becoming more complex as the system grows in complexity, and slower and more error prone in execution. This is because over time we're testing more and more of the real system. After all, we're testing the state of the real thing. One very serious limitation that this tends to surface is that we could end up including the edges of our system where real I.O. happens, in the scope of our low-level test-driven development unit tests. This means that we haven't really controlled the variables very well. 
The risk is that we end up with even simple tests testing lots more of the system than really matters to them. So our tests run the risk of being slower and more fragile. The London School forces us to abstract at these points, and that gives us the freedom to mock out the problematic I.O. at the edges of our system. When I talk about test-driven development, I can almost guarantee that I will get questions along the lines of, yes, but how do you test a UI? Or yes, but how do I test my database? The London School helps with answering that. At the point in my code where it touches one of these edges, I'm going to create an abstraction of that edge. Whatever its nature, I'm going to involve my code at that edge to do exactly but only what my system needs it to do. So this is my minimal interface with the outside world. Yes, I've added a layer of code, but I've also improved the abstraction of my system. I can switch out different versions of the edge code if I want to. I can test the core of my system thoroughly and very, very quickly, all in memory, without ever touching one of these ed troublesome edges. There's more to it than that, but we'll talk about that another time. That's all a big win to my mind. The risk with the London School is that by verifying the interactions between the fine-grained components, we're getting rather close to how the sausage is made. A small change in implementation can invalidate these interactions. As I said earlier, I've seen some really terrible messes encoded in MUX. I think that this is always a symptom of poor design. Not in the test, but in the code. But we're all prone to making mistakes in design from time to time. The trick of staying sane, of making London School work well, is to worry about the abstraction of every one of these interactions. If your class is inter interacting with 10 different things and you're mocking them all in a test, then your design needs work and you should drive it in the direction of limiting the number of such interactions and so limiting the number of dependencies you need to mock. I get itchy if I have more than a couple of dependencies in any class. This is not a hard and fast rule, but a rule of thumb, which I will compromise for some kinds of code, sure, but rather like the number of parameters in a function or lines of code in a function, it serves as a useful alarm bell that you should go off and make pause and think harder. Do I really want to do this? And can I think of how to change my design to avoid it? My own approach to test room development is a combination of the Chicago and London schools, like every other experienced TDD practitioner that I know of. I've not spoken enough here about the value of acceptance testing that the London School promotes. This is foundational to my approach to test-driven development. These tests tell you things that low-level test-driven development doesn't. And these tests drive the development in important and useful ways. I don't think that Chicago was against this, but I don't think it called it out quite as strongly as London. If you want to learn more about acceptance testing, check out my training course, which is coming soon. Sign up to my mail list and you'll get the earliest notification of when it's out and a discount on launch. When I teach test room development, I talk about three different types of test. Two are pure Chicago, one is pure London. So this is by far my per preferred approach, this amalgamation of the two different strategies. So I guess that what I'm advising to you is not a Chicago approach, not a London approach, but maybe a mid-Atlantic approach to test room development. Thank you very much for watching.